first became interested in studying the wild burrows while working out here on a different project with the USGS looking at plants and birds and seeing these wild donkeys everywhere. And what I found particularly interesting about them is that this place once had many animals, much like wild burrows, big, large, plant-eating herbivores that went extinct not too long ago, 12,000 years ago on this continent from human hunting. And so the return of these burrows brings all sorts of questions about how ecosystems work and whether these animals are restoring lost capacities to influence the environment. I'm particularly interested in how they affect the availability of water in the desert. So I've been remarkably lucky to find these incredible oases in the desert where groundwater seeps to the surface. And these are the biodiversity hotspots of these desert ecosystems, full of birds and plants. And in some cases, these are the only water sources within dozens of kilometers in the desert. But many of these systems become extremely monotypic, one plant species dominating. And without flood disturbance or animal disturbance, these systems can become extremely inaccessible to other animals and even lose their surface water from all the plants sucking that water into the air. But there are some of these sites that I've found where burrows make these open glades by browsing and grazing vegetation. Because they are so large, they can stomp and dig and graze out wetlands and maintain access to surface water up to a meter and a half in depth. And more plant species and animal species. This is something that we'd only see if we dropped the label of invasive from wild burrows and horses. I've put trail cameras on these water points, and those let me quantify both the activity patterns of burrows and mountain lions, and also what other species are using these wetlands and these wells that they're digging. As many as, I think it's about 65 species are drinking from these water points, which is just incredible. And this has never been described in the scientific literature. Probably because it doesn't fit the narrative that we've framed these animals with, which is ultimately not a scientific narrative, but a value-based one. So this is this really unique environment that's created by this megafaunal disturbance. In some river systems, this kind of pool would be created by flooding, um, which would scour out vegetation. But these, this site, many sites like it in the desert don't receive floods. They're groundwater fed and they're in these low disturbance systems. So I'm really curious as to what animals are using this compared to these undisturbed sites. And as De Death Valley National Park removes the burrows here, I'm interested in how these places change and how the animals plants that are using them change. You can see the real difference here uh, with the disturbance by the, by the wild burrows. There's less vegetation, there's open channel, there's clear, deep surface water. And then without the burrows where there's no flood disturbance and no megafauna disturbance, water is about a centimeter or two deep. It's often very, very muddy and extremely dense, which is presenting a habitat that some species are going to prefer, and this is presenting habitat that other species will prefer. And uh, these are the types of questions that bring us back to millions of years of Earth history where large animals were disturbing environments like this. We tend to think of disturbance as being not part of the world, but it's actually part of Earth's history for millions of years. And this trampling, this grazing by introduced donkeys is actually making this place more similar to how it was before humans arrived some 12,000 years ago. So one key question in how wild donkeys and wild horses affect ecosystems is the context in which they live. And one of the big contexts that influences herbivores are predators, particularly large-bodied apex predators, like wolves or mountain lions, in the case of these deserts here in the Southwest. Apex predation is an ecological context that is rarely taken into account when we've studied wild equids, and it's certainly not taken into account when we talk about the horse and burrow problem. My preliminary research is finding that mountain lions are really do strongly influence wild burrows through predation and through causing what we call in ecology a, a landscape of fear. And the landscape of fear idea is that the risk of being attacked by a predator varies according to topography and environment ambush cover, etc. 
And so you get a landscape where there's peaks of high fear and then valleys where fear is low. And so you see animal activities corresponding to those peaks and valleys. In the Mojave Desert, one of the sites I work at is this amazing jungle spring. And in this spring, there are these little glades that the burrows have carved out in the vegetation. And almost every single one of those, just a little ways off, there's a, a little tiny trail through the jungle that the mountain lions have made. And then there'll be piles of dead burrows. So here we are, this is off of a burrow trail. Um, this burrow and this one, and there's a couple others over here. We're all dragged here by a mountain lion and eaten in this thicket, this jungle. If you spend any time walking around here, you'll find tons of burrows that have been killed by mountain lions. Some of my preliminary results are showing that there are areas with lots of mountain lions where wild burrows are very tentative and reluctant to go, which prevents burrows from completely using the spring in its entirety and forces them to use these narrow pockets where they create these open freshwater glades. It's really pretty astounding, especially given that nobody thinks that burrows have predators. And that's part of the myth that hopefully my work will help dispel and help us understand what context this type of predation can happen. Wild and horses and burrows as formerly domesticated animals exists in this weird in-between space where we often don't have the right words to talk about them. One that props up all the time in regards to introduced species, and it's a value of nativism, where certain species have a different intrinsic right to exist than other species because of our involvement in moving them somewhere. The term invasive I find problematic when applied to any species. It is extremely anthropomorphic and emotional, and it infers intent that this introduced species built ships to come here to pillage. And by giving it intent, it justifies us in all sorts of lethal, inhumane, and unethical ways of treating these sentient beings. We could ask a whole different series of questions if we just change that valuation and that narrative about them. I'm not interested in advocacy per se, but I'm fascinated by them as animals, as megafauna. Large-bodied animals are some of the most endangered in the world, and they've been part of the Earth's system since the beginning. For 30 to 40 million years, every continent on Earth was teemed with a diversity of big animals. And so I'm fascinated by how these introduced animals uh, are functioning in, in modern ecosystems. One way to look at this is to think about what would happen if burrows were removed. In the 90s, they removed all the burrows from Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge in Nevada, a beautiful place full of groundwater springs. And many of these springs uh, filled in with vegetation and some of them actually dried up completely. And a number of endemic fish populations, which are these really endangered organisms in the desert, actually went extinct from this. So it, these animals play a really important role in maintaining these, these resource points. Now I'd avoid calling these, these processes good or bad. If we call them good, we end up living in the same kind of binary judgment system that leads us to calling them invasive. As scientists, we can, we can focus on data and leave the value judgments for the people that are making the decisions. <laughs>